Welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're going to be talking about seven reasons F sharp sucks. So I came across owner Gummis's top seven reasons F sharp sucks on LinkedIn and Reddit and thought it was worth a reblog. I frequently write about F sharp here on the blog and sometimes it's nice to get another perspective on things. So here are the top seven reasons that F sharp sucks and some personal anecdotes from my years working with F sharp to go with them. Number seven, you start talking weird. You say computation expressions and railway oriented programming out loud and suddenly your team stops inviting you to lunch. F-sharp syntax, its ML background, and its type system lend itself towards patterns that are not as common in more mainstream C-like languages, especially those that have been popular for the last decade or two that are more object-oriented leaning. This means a whole world of patterns that you or your coworkers may not have seen yet, or may have seen just by a different name. Some examples of these that you'll see a lot that I didn't really know about or think about too much um, when I was coming from OO land and C-sharp are things like computation expressions, railway-oriented programming, partial application, currying, monads, actors, pipes, discriminated unions, exhaustive pattern matching, option and result chaining, just to name a few. And if you're curious about more what some of these are, I have a few links to some more resources to learn more. And I found that even promoting results or option types has rendered weird looks from coworkers, especially if they haven't used a niche language themselves, a la Rust, Haskell, Scala, etc., that uses these. And I think results or option are really like totally possible in any language. And I think they make basically any language better. And so like from my standpoint, this is like the very smallest step we could get towards um, this kind of programming paradigm. But even that tiny step often unleashes a, a reaction of odd looks because it's just very uncommon for people. And back at Rippling, when I was writing Python, um, I promoted this type in Python. So you can learn more about results in Python here. Now that said, I think that this oddness is actually a good thing. It means that you're being exposed to new ideas. They're not usually new. They've actually been around since like the 80s and 70s and stuff like that. They're relatively new to like the mainstream programming language market and they're actually pretty good. At the very least, it forces you to consider a different way to program and while you might not take everything with you, there's sure to be some paradigms that you find useful and more generally applicable to kind of any language and application you decide to create. And I kind of find that there's probably like a 20% of these functional paradigms that I find myself using even in other paradigms in other languages and will go so far as to, you know, again, propose them in other languages, even if they're not like standard. Results and options being some examples of those. Nulls will haunt you. So you used to live with null. Now when you see one, your eye starts to flinch like a war flashback. F sharp does a pretty good job of removing nulls internally, though I will say you still need to program defensively at the edges because there are places where nulls will try to creep in. And F sharp does this by preferring options, which is a value either exists with some or is missing none. And then when you couple this with exhaustive pattern matching, then we get a nice way to describe and ensure that we handle these cases. So it's not like, um, in C sharp or a lot of object oriented programming where an object can implicitly always be null. Um, it really tries to be more explicit of like, if this thing could be missing, you have to handle both cases. And so we kind of miss that billion dollar mistake because it forces us to handle them explicitly. And now I'm not saying that like, you know, it's gonna fix nulls all the time. Like I said, it still creeps in because it forces you to handle this explicitly and the compiler can often help you find out where those cases are. It does reduce the surface area of potential errors, um, which is really all we're trying to do when we, you know, program defensively. And I will say that missing values are a very common scenario. Like there's so many cases where like you could provide something or not provide something and that can be totally valid. And so I don't think we can or even really should get rid of their representation in programming languages. But what we should do is make the language help you spot and handle them safely so we don't have a bunch of pitfalls. We just have another valid case that a type can be in. Slightly related is how to write simple, clear F-sharp option pipelines with option dot or else with. This is a bit more on option chaining. And while we're on the subject, I do want to note that .NET will try to leak nulls when interacting with some C-sharp libraries. Like I've had this problem a lot with Entity Framework. You'll do like a, you know, single or default and what F-sharp sees is that this must exist, but actually on the C-sharp side, it's very possible that it would pass a null to you. And so there are edge cases here, but if you're looking out for them, then they're relatively easy to handle. You can just handle them right around the edges. Um, or even better, just use a library that doesn't do this. So just avoid some of those C-sharp libraries that are um, doing some weird stuff. Five, your buggy code won't even compile. F-sharp refuses to run until you've handled every weird edge case. So F-sharp supports expressive types, discriminated unions, and exhaustive pattern matching, which helps you model your domain precisely and ensure you've handled all of its edge cases. 
Now this won't catch everything, but it does catch a large swath of issues where you said a type was A, but your code is treating it like B or is failing to handle some case of A. So generally, if it compiles, it's more likely to have less bugs because at least you've covered all cases as described by the types. And because the types are so expressive, you can model more cases with them. And you should still write tests, of course, but you will find that the strong expressive types can allow you to make many failure cases unrepresentable so that the compiler protects you from them with no need for tests. And we see this a lot with like um, how dynamic languages kind of choose to deal with this stuff like Elixir and Clojure and stuff. What they do is they often do like parameterized tests where they're trying to test like all possible values for what can go in here, which is like, fine, that's a fair way to do this stuff. But if you use a type, you can literally say like, this can only be a number. Um, and you can even be more explicit, like this can be only a positive number. And now your parameterized test doesn't need to test strings. It doesn't need to test nulls or floats or doubles or anything like that, because we know based on the type that only these numbers, these positive numbers can be passed to it or else the whole thing wouldn't even compile. And so I think types are like an excellent way to encode your rules in a way that like you do it once and you don't need all of these like hundreds, thousands of tests. I'm testing the invalid cases because it literally cannot happen in the system. I have another blog post on testing and types um, around. So if you want to link to that, uh, let me know and I'll link it below. Number four, C-sharp follows F-sharp features from 10 years ago, and you'll painfully watch it catch up one keynote at a time. It is always amusing to watch a company or technology proudly announce features that your choice has had for years and even decades. C-sharp does make big releases each year, and lately most have pulled a feature, sometimes more, from F-sharp, often in a less ergonomic form. And similar to Apple's keynotes pulling from Android, C-sharp's releases often get more hype. Amusing, but not totally uncalled for. They are better at producing hype, the feature is already proven and asked for by the community and, at least in C-sharp's case, has a much larger user base to hype up. And we say that it's only like a decade ago, but uh, honestly, some of these things have been around again since like the 70s, if not in full implementation and usage, at least in theory. Um, so yeah, it's, it's taken a while for some of these uh, ideas to catch on and, and start to hit the mainstream. And honestly, I'm not that mad about it. I'm glad to see C-sharp pulling from some of the great design features F-sharp has and figuring out a way to make it work for its existing code base and audience. Like you can't just pull a feature verbatim from another language and just plop it in yours because it's not gonna have the same syntax. It might not even work that way based on however your language is already set up. And you're gonna need to find a way that it plays nicely with the other structures and patterns and paradigms that exist in that language um, so that it's not like a weird wart on it that's just like nobody wants to touch because it's like so different from everything else. And I think it's a sign that the creators care about the language and their user base and are willing to learn from other languages to improve their own. It gives me confidence that five years from now, C-sharp will be a much better language than it is today and a little hope that other mainstream languages will continue this trend or follow suit bringing more powerful and ergonomic tools to their ecosystems as well. So as of today, based on my research, C-sharp now has immutable records pattern matching, which, you know, is a bit clunky, but they do exist. Discriminated unions, which is, again, a little bit clunky, but does exist. Pipes via an external package and null safety if you turn it on in the project. So it took a while and they're maybe not as elegant as F-sharp's implementations and they don't have everything that makes F-sharp quite elegant and ergonomic and useful, but they do exist which does make C-sharp a much better language overall, in my opinion. And, you know, given the rate at which they are bringing features over, I have high confidence that it will continue to improve um, over the next few years. The job market is a desert. You're not unemployable, you're niche. The truth is the F-sharp job market is small. Jobs do exist, but they are rare. This is one of the biggest problems with the F-sharp ecosystem today. See the state of F-sharp and a somewhat of a programming language death or at least stagnation spiral. F-sharp jobs do exist, but I wouldn't bet my career on one. And I personally have never had a gig that wrote F-sharp. On the other hand, I do think the patterns and ideas you learn while coding with F-sharp will uplevel your understanding of programming patterns and make you a better engineer and thus a more hireable engineer over time. But I realize that's kind of secondary and doesn't help you pay your bills today. Like if you're just out of college and you're trying to get a job, I probably wouldn't recommend F-sharp to you for the simple fact that you should, it's not gonna help you be marketable. And um, you're probably gonna wanna use like, you know, a Python or a C-sharp or a TypeScript, a, a thing that has really high market penetration so that you look marketable to more and more jobs because you're trying to land that first job to gain that experience to then make yourself, you know, make sure you can even support yourself over time. And then 
after you can support yourself, after you have something on your resume and you know you are a solid engineer and can get other jobs, that's when I would really recommend looking at F-sharp because it is gonna open your eyes to so many other things. And at that point you will have the kind of career capital that like you can support yourself. Like this pursuit of F-sharp isn't gonna get in the way of you being able to um, have a good gig or job. Now I wanna point out that there really is nothing stopping you from building a successful business with F-sharp and therefore having plenty of jobs with F-sharp. It is quite good at domain modeling and general purpose programming. Anything C-sharp or Python, or even JavaScript or TypeScript, at least on the back end, um, F-sharp can do all of that same stuff. And I've personally built many of my projects with F-sharp and built a project template Cloud Seed to help me launch my own F-sharp web apps faster. And there are dozens of companies all over the world using F-sharp in production. But it is true, there just aren't that many jobs available. So again, if you're new and you're looking for a job, F-sharp probably won't help you get that job, even though I think it will make you a much better engineer over time, which over time will make you much more hireable. Related to this is what we learned running F-sharp in production for five years, lessons from people that are running businesses um, with F-sharp. Number two, making illegal states unrepresentable becomes an obsession. Three months later, nothing compiles and you cry in union types. Now, building with types forced me into a different way of thinking. It forces you to precisely model your domain up front so that you can handle all its permutations later. This is, I think, what sits at the core of functional programming, modeling data and transformations separately whereas object-oriented tends to focus more on data and transformations together. In general, I think this is great because it does catch a lot of edge case behavior and makes you handle them, but it can be a pain as you now have to handle those cases, whereas another language might have missed them completely, like it's just unhandled, but it's fine with it. It's like, whatever, I'll run. Or it might have decided to throw exceptions to avoid handling them entirely, which is still possible in F-sharp and similar languages, but usually frowned upon because you do want to handle all cases and have like an actual explicit way that you want to do things. Add in a bit of eagerness and you might find yourself trying to define the whole universe, which can be a tricky prospect, especially if you're new to discriminated unions and pattern matching and how do you actually like persist that into databases and how do you pass that stuff around? Um, you can definitely make a program that, you know, is functionally correct, but ends up being um, quite hard to maneuver around because the way that you've modeled it makes it difficult. Now for more on this, I would recommend Domain Modeling Made Functional by Scott Woloshin, who also writes F-sharp for fun and profit. It's the best book on DDD that I've ever read. I think it's super approachable. It really connects like how do you figure out, you know, what's in the business and how do you actually like model that in a system and how do you build a system that reflects the domain that you're actually trying to build for, but removes unnecessary complexity that really comes from the technical side of things, which I think is great. And it kind of skips a lot of like the textbooky stuff. Um, and a lot of these, you know, DDD tomes that are just kind of like hard to reason about and see how it like actually relates to the real world. Plus all of the examples are in F sharp. So if you're trying to learn F sharp, I think this is a great way to do it, but F-sharp and especially its types are so readable that um, anyone who's done any programming before should be able to understand it. So if you wanna learn more about the types and how to model things, like I would definitely recommend this book. And finally, you can't go back. Once you've written F-sharp, every other language feels like handwriting and wingdings font. And I think that F-sharp is an amazingly designed language and there are bits you will miss in other languages. Things that pop up to me are pipes, expressive strong types, unions and exhaustive pattern matching, collection iterations, and some of the syntax. But I will note that other languages are taking note and building their own versions of these things when they make sense. They might not be as ergonomic and they might not even be in the standard library, but most of them can be done effectively in most languages. So even if you miss some of these things, don't fret too much. Maybe it just needs a bit of activism and open source contributions to get it in your language of choice. And in my experience, you can get, I don't know, 60 to 80% of the good parts in most languages, depends on the language, depends on what you're trying to pull out, even if they are maybe 2x as clunky at first. Because again, this is a very different paradigm. And so if you're pulling some of these things into object oriented, it's just gonna have to look different because the whole code base was built different. As a more concrete example, I think F-sharp beats out Python in many cases, but you can still bring F-sharp like records and result types into Python. They're just not in the sh shared library. And this is something that I usually look for in any programming language nowadays, because I think these patterns or this like type is so useful across basically all forms of programming. Next. Now, F-sharp remains an A-tier language for me, 
but like any technology choice, it does have its flaws. Jobs are scarce and the community is small, but I still recommend people try it because it's fun and you learn some interesting things along the way. If you're curious about building web apps with F Sharp, I built CloudSeed and F Sharp Project Boilerplate to make spinning up F Sharp web apps easier. And for more on this in practice, you can look at spin up a full stack F Sharp web app in 10 minutes with the CloudSeed project template. Now, if you like this post, you might also like why F Sharp is a fun programming language, how I got interested in F Sharp, and if you're just starting, the best way to get started learning and building with F Sharp. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.